Uh, thank you for that. I am thrilled to be here at my first EST conference. Uh, coming from the United States where translation studies is still relatively small and a little embattled, I was awestruck when I saw the final conference program. So congratulations again to the conference organizers. Um, I'm also delighted to be here in Germersheim, this uh, tiny town with such an enormous reputation in the field of translation and interpreting studies. Let me begin by saying that for several centuries now, Russia has troubled our Western models of center and periphery. This is no less true in translation studies than it is in the realm of politics, economics, and geography. From at least the early 18th century, when Peter the Great issued a decree on how texts should be translated, translation has been closely associated with service to the state and to the nation, making it highly visible not only as a practice, but as a trope for understanding Russians' place in the world. And so translation in Russia, uh, I would say, to borrow a phrase from Claude Lévi-Strauss, is good to think. Today I would like to discuss a phenomenon which at first glance might appear to be peripheral in just about every sense of the word, uh, and to suggest how it might in fact help us to interrogate and revalue in the Nietzschean sense our Western models of literary production that consistently relegate translators and translation to all kinds of peripheries. For those unfamiliar with Russian translation history or with translation under totalitarian regimes, the phrase gulag translations might have a somewhat bizarre ring to it. Nevertheless, the production of translations of great literary works by inmates in Soviet prisons occurred with enough frequency, I would argue, to be categorized as a cultural phenomenon, and so should be treated not as an aberration in Soviet culture uh, produced by the inhuman conditions of the Soviet gulag system, but rather as a thoroughly representative phenomenon, even a hyper-representative one, to the extent that violence and conflict often lay bare what the semiotician Yuri Lotman referred to as the unpredictable workings of culture. As a kind of micro-history, my study of Gulag uh, translations contributes to recent, recent scholarship on culture in conditions of violence and conflict, such as Polina Barskova's research on the literary life of Leningrad during the 900-day siege, or Mikaela Wolf's recent work on interpreters in German concentration camps. This micro-history is informed not only by recent revisionist interpretations of Soviet culture, which reveal it to be far more complex and nuanced than our Cold War models could admit, but also by recent discussions in translation studies over the Eurocentrism of the field that seek to problematize our notions of center and periphery. And of course, what better place to investigate the Eurocentrism of translation studies than at this magnificent meeting of the European Society for Translation Studies. My argument that Gulag translations are representative of broader aspects of Soviet society is based on two premises. First, that the number of Russians imprisoned at some point or points in their lives for multiple incarcerations were not uncommon, represented a significant portion of the population in general and of Russia's intelligentsia in particular. As Anne Applebaum explains, the total number of prisoners in the camps generally hovered around two million, but the total number of Soviet citizens who had some experience of the camps as political or criminal prison prisoners is far higher. The best estimates indicate that some 18 million people passed through this massive system. About another six million were sent into exile. The fact that so many Soviet citizens experienced the gulag either firsthand or through the experience of family members and friends suggests the pervasive influence of the gulag on various aspects of Soviet culture. Second, while as Applebaum points out, the gulag had its own laws, its own customs, its own morality, even its own slang, the gulag experience was not an anomalous expression of Soviet power. It was arguably only the most extreme and brutal expression of it. As Applebaum notes, Gulag has come to mean the Soviet repressive system itself, the set of procedures the prisoners once called the meat grinder, the arrests, the interrogations, the transport in unheated cattle cars, the forced labor, the destruction of families, the years spent in exile, the early and unnecessary deaths. The culture of the Gulag was, Applebaum argues, a microcosm of Soviet culture on the outside. 
The population of the Gulag and the population of the rest of the USSR shared many things besides suffering. Both in the camps and outside them, it was possible to find the same slovenly work practices, the same cru criminally stupid bureaucracy, the same corruption, and the same sullen disregard for human life. Or as the 19th century writer and translator Mikhail Mikhailov put it, beyond the prison walls one hears the silence of the prison, and beyond, beyond the prison walls one hears the sound of prisoners' chains. The relationship between the Gulag and Soviet society outside the Gulag, one could argue, was isomorphic. With that being said, I would like to explore the cultural logic of Gulag translations by situating them first diachronically within a tradition of prison translations in Russia that stretches back to the early 19th century, and second, synchronically within the rarefied literary culture of the Soviet intelligentsia. The tradition of prison translation in Russia dates back to the second quarter of the 19th century following the failed Decemberist revolt of 1825, which left many representatives of Russia's polyglot elite in prison or in exile in Siberia. For these highly educated and refined young men, translation served as a mode of psychological and spiritual survival, certainly, but also as a vehicle of political and moral resistance. The Decembrist poets, in fact, so many of these Decembrists were poets that there's now a term, Paeti de Cabriste, the Decembrist poets. Two of them, Wilhelm Kuchelbecher and Alexander Muravyov, for example, both engaged in major translation projects while in prison and in exile. Kuchelbecher spent much of his confinement translating Shakespeare's history plays, as well as the tragedies Macbeth and King Lear, trying to make sense of his own historical predicament. And while Kuchelbecher's views on his political opposition appear to have grown more conservative during his incarceration, his fascination with the popular spirit of Shakespeare's plays can be seen as a nod in the direction of a more democratic notion of state power. Hugo Becker's translations of Shakespeare's historical dramas, which were never published in his lifetime, were, however, among the first Russian translations of those plays. Alexander Muravyov, during his many years of exile in Siberia, occupied himself with the translation of the New Testament Book of Matthew. And while it might seem to be, while it might be tempting to see this act uh, as a retreat from politics into the realm of spirituality, the translation of the Bible was in fact thoroughly politicized in early 19th century Russian, perhaps no less so than it was in early modern England. The new interpretive authority uh, of vernacular translation of the Bible gave to lay readers made these translations into a metaphor for the transformation of subjects into citizens. Debates over vernacular translation of the Bible came late in Russia uh, and were very heated in the first decades of the 19th century as pietism and Freemasonry swept through the Russian educated classes. The first complete vernacular translation of the Bible appeared in Russia only in 1876. Uh, incidentally, the politics of Bible translation in Russia was not lost on the Tsar, Nicholas I, who immediately shut down the Russian Bible Society following the failed Decemberist revolt. A generation after the Decembrists, the radical publicist and translator Mikhail Mikhailov also produced some notable prison translations among his other progressive activities in prison. He managed to uh, uh, set up a school for the children of serfs and servants and wrote articles which he published under a pseudonym. Famous before his incarceration as the Russian translator of Heinrich Heine, he continued to translate in prison, producing a translation of Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound, which he managed to have smuggled out of prison and published in 1863 under a pseudonym. In that work, Mikhailov expresses his view on the state of the country, on the bloodthirsty autocracy, on the mass shootings of peasants, and on the arrest of revolutionaries, and on his own situation. Mikhailov also translated an excerpt from Thomas Moore's Irish Melodies, uh, inspired by the failed Irish uprising of 1798, which was brutally suppressed by the British Army. Toward the end of the 19th century, the political radical Pyotr Yakubovich translated Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal while serving out his sentence for political subversion in the Peter and Paul Fortress in St. Petersburg, and then in exile in Siberia. For Russians of Yakubovich's generation, Baudelaire was a politically radical figure. Yakubovich interpreted Baudelaire's poem through the lens of political romanticism, having been influenced by an article by Henri Seillard published in the radical journal Slova, which presented the Frenchman not as a decadent, but as a realist. 
Yakubovich also attempted through his translations to attenuate the charge of indecency that surrounded Baudelaire at the time, refusing to translate three poems that had been censored in France as pornographic. In this way, he created a Russian Baudelaire that was significantly different from the French and English ones, and that would live on into the Soviet period. For Yakubovich, as for the others mentioned above, translations serve not only as a means to express their political views, but also to overcome their isolation and to ward off depression and insanity. As Yakubovich said of Baudelaire, quote, in these difficult years, Baudelaire was for me a friend and consoler, and I, on my part, gave him much of the best of my heart's blood. Similarly, Kuchelbecher declared Homer and Shakespeare to be his pain quotidien. I should also add here that Vladimir uh, Lenin advised imprisoned radicals to spend their time in prison translating. The exalted place of literature in Soviet intelligentsia circles is also crucial to our understanding of the immediate context of Gulag translations. The role of the great works of world and especially Western literature for the Soviet era intelligentsia cannot be underestimated. As Katerina Clark notes, quote, the almost naive faith in literature's power shared by the members of the Soviet era intelligentsia, even in the darkest days of Stalinist uh, uh, oppression. Uh, Clark describes in the following way. Yevgenia Ginsburg reports how in 1937, she and her fellow convicts took Pushkin in their hearts to the frozen wastes of Siberia, virtually as Christians took the Holy Writ to the catacombs. The first works of European literature by Tolstoy and Bloch, Stendhal and Balzac helped her keep faith in prison and ward off thoughts of suicide. Or as Varlam Shalamov expresses a similar notion in his Kalima tales, based on his years of incarceration and exile in the Gulag system. I know that everyone has something that is most precious to him. The last thing that he has left and is that something which helps him to live, to hang on to the life of which we were being so insistently and stubbornly deprived. If for Zamyatin this was the liturgy of John the Baptist, then my last thing was verse. Everything else had long since been forgotten, cast aside, driven from memory. Only poetry had not been crushed by exhaustion, frost, hunger, and endless humiliations. Lev Gumilov, the son of the poets Anna Akhmatov and Nikolai Gumilov, while serving his 10-year sentence in the Gulag system, participated in poetry gatherings organized by the inmates when he wasn't working on his scholarly monograph, The History of Central Asia. As a fellow inmate, Savyanka described the gatherings, quote, at one point in the depths of the barracks, we began to hold literary poetic evenings involving the recitation of poetry. Lev Nikolaevich had no equal in terms of the volume of his poetic knowledge. He recited by hearts poems by Nikolai Gumilov, Alexei Tolstoy, Fiat Baratinsky, Bloch, some unknown contemporary images and symbolists, as well as Byron and Dante. For two evenings in a row, he recited the Divine Comedy. I should add that the Divine Comedy, especially the Inferno, was a favorite work of imprisoned Soviet intellectuals. Mandelstam took a pocket-sized edition with him to the Gulag and uh, 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 Daniel also read uh, that work throughout his prison stay. But perhaps nowhere are the workings of the literary poly system in the prison better documented than in the prison memoir written by the historian and philologist Yevgenia Ginsburg. Her memoir was first published in the Soviet Union in 1966 during the Khrushchev Thaw. Throughout the lengthy memoir, Ginsburg invokes the great works of world literature both in Russian and in translation to dignify the humiliating and degrading life of the Gulag. For Ginsburg, literature was a kind of alternative universe, an escape from the brutality and inhumanity of Soviet life under Stalin, a way to dignify and make sense of her predicament. The recitation of verse throughout her incarceration is especially important in this regard. While at times the, it served as a form of black humor and a kind of absurd mixing of high and low, it was most often a way for Ginsburg to humanize her experiences and to inscribe herself within a timeless, what she saw as a timeless high culture in order to ward off total despair and to overcome her isolation. Uh, for not only was she imprisoned in a very remote part of Russia, she was also often kept in solitary uh, confinement. She writes, tomorrow at this time I would have visitors, Tolstoy and Bloch, Stendhal and Balzac, how stupid I had been to have thoughts of death. And later, such were our black days of sleep and our nights of blinding light and surreptitious reading. Such was our life of physical and mental suffering, of transfigured hours in the society of books of alternate hope and despair. When bidding good night to her bunkmate Yulia, for example, Ginsburg would quote the lines from, from the poet Nikrasov, kind sleep that makes the prisoner a king. 
But literature also had a more practical function in the context of the gulag as it did outside the prison walls. It provided the material for an elaborate secret code to evade censorship. In her letters to her mother, for example, she invented fictional children as stand-ins for herself and her relatives. She was Little Eva, a reference to the young girl in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. As she commented in her memoir, our system worked beautifully. By writing about ourselves as if we were children, we got all kinds of strictly forbidden information past the censor without arousing suspicions. This, of course, was no small feat considering the censor was so suspicious, even references to illness were suspected of containing some hidden meaning. The meaning of literature, one could say, therefore, was overdetermined in the repressive context of the gulag, uh, both for the incarcerated prisoners and for the censors. Indeed, Ginsburg notes that the experience of reading was actually enhanced in prison, where it constitutes virtually her only pastime. And so having contextualized the phenomenon of gulag translations, it's time to speak of the gulag translators themselves. I would like to briefly discuss five well-known gulag translators, Tatyana Grigoryevna Gnidic, Ivan Alexeyevich Lihachov, Sergei Vladimirovich Petrov, Yuli Markovich Daniel, and Nikolai Alexeyevich Zabalotsky. One could also include Joseph Brodsky here, who engaged in the translation of English Renaissance poetry while in internal exile in Siberia in the 70s, but I'll leave that to the Brodsky experts. Uh, in any case, the experience of these five individuals will, I think, highlight translation in Soviet Russia as a highly complex and contested cultural field, which confounds our reductive Cold War dichotomies that for so long organized our study of Soviet society. Tatyana Gnedich was the great grandniece of the first Russian translator of Homer, Nikolai Gnedich. She was a translator and teacher of English in Leningrad before her arrest in 1945 and her incarceration for 10 years, quote unquote, for betrayal of the Soviet motherland. A survivor of the siege of Leningrad, Gnedich impressed the investigator with the fact that she had memorized the first 2,000 lines of Byron's Don Juan. This feat of memory was rewarded with a typewriter, a Webster's Dictionary, and a complete edition of the English original of Byron's poems. Ganeja spent the next two years in a single cell so that she could complete her translation. As if he Medkin notes, Ganeja rarely went out and she read nothing. She lived on the verses of Byron. The story became a legend when upon her release, her translation of Don Juan, which she had sent from prison to Mikhail Lazinsky, the famous translator of Dante's Inferno, was published by the publishing house Hudojastvane Literatura in a print run of 100,000 and to great critical acclaim. Ivan Lichachov was a member of the poet Mikhail Kuzmin's inner circle. Widely recognized in intelligentsia circles as a brilliant translator of European poetry, Likhachov had limited success in getting his translation published in official venues, due in part to his friendship with Kuzmin, his association with the avant-garde Oberiu poets, and his eccentric behavior. He is believed to have been the prototype of Kostya Rotikov and Konstantin Vaginov's 1927 novel Kozlyanya Pesin, one of the very few gay characters in Soviet literature. Some of Likhachov's translators, uh, translations appeared in a 1937 anthology of English poetry, but without attribution. This was also the case with his finest translation of the French poets Du Bellet, De Porte et d'Aubigny, that appeared in the 1938 anthology Poets of the French Renaissance. A teacher for many years at the Higher Military Naval School and later head of the Department of Foreign Languages there, he was arrested in 1940 and sentenced to eight years in prison on the charge of espionage. His knowledge of so many languages and his uh, contact with foreigners was seen as great, very suspicious. Uh, he was released in 1945 and was sent to live in the city of Volsk in the Saratov region where he worked as a custodian in the local library. In August of 1948, he was sent to live in Frunze and in November of that year, he was arrested a second time Virtual, with virtually no basis. This time he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. When he was released, he was again sent to Frunze, but he eventually made his way back to Leningrad, where beginning in 1959, he led a seminar for translators of English prose at the House of Writers. And there are many uh, very fond memoirs of that on the internet now from his former students. Like Gnedic's prison translations were not only feats of versification, but also feats of memory. Likhachov knew all of Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal by heart. His translations were perhaps more openly oppositional than Gnedic's, although Byron had a reputation in Russia as an individualist and a freedom fighter. In any case, Likhachov's translations of Baudelaire, especially of the uh, uh, poem Epigrapha un livre condamné, can easily be read as a defense of individual difference in a society of repressive conformity.
if you don't like me, be damned. His daring may be explained by the fact that he entertained little hope that his translations would ever be published, but several of his translations of Baudelaire did make it into the first collection of the poet's works in Soviet Russia, Flowers of Evil of 1970, edited by Efim Edkind. This volume, released in a print run of 50,000, sold out in a matter of hours. Baudelaire was an extremely relevant figure in late Soviet society. Sergei Petrov was also a translator of French poets, including Du Bellet Ronsard and again Baudelaire. Petrov was a teacher of foreign languages in Leningrad before his arrest and subsequent exile to Siberia in 1935. He was rearrested in 1938 and held in the Atchinsky prison. He was sentenced to eight years of hard labor, but the sentence was revoked in 1939. He lived in Birilusk, Atchinsk, and Novgorod before making his way back to Leningrad. He began to tra translate only while in exile, but his translates, translations began to appear in print only after Stalin's death. In 1958, his translation of fragments from the epic poem Putin's Final Days by the Swiss author Conrad Mayer appeared in print. Petrov's resistance to the regime was expressed not only in his translations, into which he inserted prison slang, but also in the seminar on translations as scandal makers, Pirivochiki Skandaliste, that he led in the literary translation section of the Leningrad Division of the Writers' Union in the 1960s. Yuli Daniel was a poet and political dissident who was sentenced to five years of incarceration for four short stories that were published in the West under the pseudonym Nikolai Arshak. The trial of Daniel and his friend Abram uh, Tsertz was a major event in the Soviet-era dissident movement. Daniel practiced translation throughout his life, although the fate of his translations varied. He published a number of translations under his own name before his arrest, but after his arrest he could publish his translations only under the pseudonym Yuri Petrov. And the translations he published before his arrest were never republished in the Soviet period. The Russian bard Bulata Kujava admitted that the Russian translations of the work of the Armenian writer Daniel Varujan that appeared in 1984 with Akujava listed as the, as the translator were in fact done by Daniel, who was having trouble finding work. During those difficult days, Akujava wrote, Daniel was able to earn a living under my name. Like Ginsburg and Shalama's prison memoirs, Daniel's letters from prison reveal the importance of literature for his personal and spiritual survival. While in prison, he translated the poems of his fellow inmate, the Latvian poet Knut Skujenics, <laughs> imprisoned for anti-Soviet activity related to his uh, involvement in the movement to free uh, Latvia. His poems expressed a deep longing for freedom and human dignity. And my final gulag poem, Nikolai Zabalotsky, was a writer who began his career during the politically turbulent 1920s. His unusual style and literary experimentation, he was a founding member of the absurdist group Oberiu, drew increasing suspicion from official quarters. Sensing the growing danger of his situation, Zabalotsky modified his writing style and turned to translation. Among his most famous translation was that of the medieval Slavic epic, The Lay of Eager's Campaign. Zabolotsky was arrested on the charge of creating anti-Soviet propaganda and imprisoned in 1938. In a damning review, the Soviet critic uh, Lesuchevsky describes Zabolotsky's poetry as an active counter-revolutionary struggle against the Soviet stratum, the Soviet people, and socialism. During his five years of incarceration, Zabolotsky worked on a translation of the Lay of Igor's campaign, which he completed in the Siberian city of Vastaklag, where he was consigned to live following his release from prison. His much acclaimed translation of this Russian classic earned him the right to return to Moscow. For Zabolotsky, the manuscript, which, which was discovered only in the late 18th century and survived the burning of Moscow in 1814, served as a symbol of endurance through difficult times, making it, in a sense, a metaphor of his own survival. This is a quote. Now when I entered into the spirit of this monument, I was filled with the greatest reverence, amazement, and gratitude toward fate for having delivered this miracle to us from the depths of the ages. This solitary cathedral to our ancient glory, which resembles nothing else, stands in that desert of time that follows wars, fires, and when not a single stone remained atop another stone. It is frightening, terrifying to approach it. One cannot help but search out familiar proportions, golden cross-sections of our former monuments of world literature, a futile task, there are no cross-sections. Everything in it is filled with a certain gentle wildness, which the author allotted with a different standard of measure from our own, and how movingly the corners crumble. Ravens sit on it and wolves howl, and it stands, this mysterious structure that knows no equal, and it will stand forever, as long as Russian culture is alive. <laughs> 
by translating the Slova, which he considered by then to be, which was considered by then to be the foundation text of modern Russian literature, Zabolotsky was able to reconcile himself with the regime. And despite the years of incarceration and exile, the beauty and complexity of the Slova made it possible for Zabolotsky to explain in a letter to a friend during his exile, how happy I am to be Russian. Now, it is tempting to read the phenomenon of Gulag translations through a Cold War lens as simple acts of resistance that is proof of the oppositional nature of the Soviet-era intelligentsia. And indeed, the frequent references to God and religion and in intelligentsia discourse on prison translation stand in rather sharp contrast to the official atheism of the regime. Nevertheless, a closer examination of the discourse surrounding these translations suggests some profound similarities between intelligentsia and official Soviet discourse surrounding translation in general and these gulag translations in particular. Sergei Ushakin, who attempted in his analysis of dissident Samizdat texts of the Soviet period to avoid what he calls the long-standing Sovietology tradition of locating these texts exclusively within the context of dissident's ideological struggle with the dominant political structure. Uh, in fact, set a model for the revisionist uh, uh, interpretation of uh, dissident literature and, in my case, translations. Instead, Ushakin reads these dissident texts through the discursive web of Soviet society within which they were conceived or caught, arguing for a Soviet origin to the forms and rhetoric of dissident's descent. By, anal by analogy, I will argue for a common Russian origin to the forms of rhetoric of translators' resistance, both on the part of the intelligentsia and in the official uh, discourse. Analysis of intelligentsia and official discourse on translation reveals some striking similarities. In both discourses, we translation described as the heroic sacrifice of the individual for the sake of the community. This uh, continuity is perhaps most clearly uh, evident in the shared use of several key words associated with the translator's task. Trud, labor, podvik, heroic feat, and skromnost, modesty as popular in dissident discourse as they are in the official Soviet discourse on translation and literature. The trope of translation as labor is co in common in both discourses. Efim Edkin describes these prison translations as labors of love, or as Zabalotsky writes in his diary in the 1930s, you have to work and to struggle on your own. How many failures still lie ahead? How many disappointments and doubts? But if in such moment a person vacillates, he's a goner. Faith and perseverance, work and honesty. And at the trial of Joseph Brodsky in the charge of social parasitism, a literary scholar testified in Brodsky's defense, mimicking official Soviet rhetoric on the dignity of labor. Quote, verse translation is extremely difficult work, calling for devotion, knowledge, and poetic talent. Such labor calls for an unselfish love of poetry and of work itself. Translation as podvik is also a recurring motif among Russian intellectuals and, in Soviet, and, and on Soviet officials alike, stressing the heroism of these translation projects carried out under conditions of repression and deprivation. Etkin uses the term podvik to describe Gnedich's gulag translation of Don Juan, and Marshak describes the great feats of Russian literary translation as bagatirske, uh, from the Russian word bagatir, a hero of Russian folklore. And of course, many of these works were predicated on feats of memory that allowed the translator to translate works to which they had no physical access. Translate, uh, translation as feat in both intelligentsia and official discourse involves the overcoming of forbidding obstacles, making a tribute not so much to the translation, translator's genius or originality, but to his or her forbearance and acceptance of suffering. Although never incarcerated, the great Soviet translator Mikhail Lazinsky, for example, pursued his monumental translation projects, Dante's Divine Comedy and Shakespeare's dramas, in spite of a debilitating physical illness. He completed his translation of Purgatoria in Leningrad under the hellish conditions of the 900-day long siege. In her 1966 essay, A Word on Lazinsky, the poet Anna Akhmatova paints the following picture of the translator's endurance. In his work, Lazinsky was tireless, 
suffering from a serious illness that would have broken another. He continued to work and to help others, and the terrible, tortuous illness proved powerless in the face of his super, super, superhuman will. It is terrible to think that it was just at that time that he undertook the great feat, Podvik, of his life, the translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. The editors of the 1967 re-edition of Lazinski's translation of Dante used the same word as, 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 as Akhmatova to describe the work. Lazinski worked on Dante's text for more than 10 years, making his work a true feat, Podvik. The editors also made much of the fact that his translation was completed during the Siege of Leningrad, presenting the translation as an act of Russian or peculiarly Soviet endurance, of resistance to the Nazi occupation, and as a metonym for the survival of Leningrad and of the country. I quote, The Inferno and Lazinski's translation appeared in 1939. The war began when the translator was at the very pinnacle of his work, Despite the blockade of Leningrad and the difficult conditions of the besieged city, Mikhail Lazinsky continued his work. He managed to save the manuscript of his incomplete translations and all the background material. His Purgatory was published in Moscow in 1944, and in 1945, the year of victory, his Paradiso came out. We should not fail to note the surprising circumstance that during the war, when the country was in need of paper and there weren't enough typesetters, the strength and the means were nonetheless found in order to publish this timeless work by the great Italian poet. This is undeniable evidence of the great significance of Dante's poem for Soviet culture. Little did he know it was very significant for uh, oppositional uh, intelligentsia. In 1946, Lazinski's translation was awarded the state prize of the first degree. We are convinced that it will have a long life. Notice here how Lazinski's act of heroic labor was matched by the regime which found the means to publish this translation even in the most trying times. Such heroic discourse was also evident in a review in the newspaper Socialist Karaganda of a reading given by Zabalotsky in 1945 of his, re of his translation of the Lay of Igor's campaign. Quote, it is a particular joy that the translation has appeared in 1945, the year of the Russian people's victory over its most stubborn foe, as a result of which the clear and resonant poetry of the translation, telling of a heroic struggle for the independence of the land of Russia, sounds particularly close and moving. The association of translation with humility is another shared trait of Soviet intelligentsia discourse on translation. Consider the remarks of the poet and translator Arseniy Tarkovsky in his article, The Opportunities of Translation, where he criticizes the young generation of literary translators, quote, currently entering the literary scene are young poets who are not devoid of talent, but neither are they devoid, devoid of an exaggerated passion for self-promotion. Translation demands modesty, the ability to re re retreat into the background, leaving the stage to the author of the original. He concludes with a distinct note of derision. Translations no longer resemble the original. Today, they more often resemble the original work of the translator. Humility as the Russian answer to the Western cult of the individual is obvious, too, in the remarks of the Soviet writer and administrator Alexander Fadiev in regard to Boris Pasternak. When asked by a Western journalist about the popularity of Pasternak's poetry in Russian, Fadiev responded, Pasternak was never popular in the USSR with the common reader due to his extreme individualism and the formal complexity of his verse, which is difficult to understand. Today, Pasternak is translating the dramas of Shakespeare. He is famous in Russia as a translator of Shakespeare. The notion of humility was also evident in the rhetoric surrounding the Soviet school of translation, which promoted a common approach to trans translation that very much mitigated the role of the individual translator, erasing his or her traces in the text. Uh, as is uh, evident from the citations above, the continuities between official and intelligentsia discourses can be explained through reference to a common discursive enemy or enemies, Western individualism and materialism, as embodied in the romantic notion of the author, which is very closely tied to the emergence of the modern uh, literary marketplace. In both official and intelligentsia discourses, the threat of individuality is countered by acts of heroic self-sacrifice. As Sergei Petrov's widow commented, he didn't translate according to the Soviet model, a great poet who cannot publish is forced to do translations to feed himself. A kitten couldn't feed itself on his income. He translated just as he wrote, for himself and for God, for the drawer. He knew 12 languages and loved and translated many authors. <clears throat> 
Ignoring the religious overtones, this rejection of the capitalist market is, of course, something the intelligentsia shared with the regime, and is evident in Netkin's description of Tatyana Gnedich as urodliva, a holy fool, someone who didn't work for money or status. This disdain for capitalism allies well with the official Soviet discourse, uh, and especially concerning uh, Dante, uh, who was described as uh, anti-bourgeois uh, and uh, his Florence was described as an anthill of, of commerce. The theme of self-sacrifice is also present in Edkin's recounting Gennady's translation of Don Juan, which he entitled Involuntary Cross, a notion tied closely to the religious virtues of modesty and acceptance of suffering, which despite their Christian overtones were much vaunted in official Soviet rhetoric as well. Consider the prosecutor's remark after reading the first pages of Gennady's translation of Don Juan, which he had written in tiny letters on paper with the heading Evidence of the Accused. He said, for this, you should be awarded the Stalin Prize. While not to deny the existence of real differences between intelligentsia and official Soviet views on literary production, they appear nonetheless to have shared a common vision of translation that stands in sharp contrast to Western models of authorship, in which Fritz Gutbart puts it, originality is the guarantor of subjectivity. In Soviet Russia, a society that, in the words of Svetlana Boyum, privileges social totality and neglects or subordinates the human individual in general terms, translation became a site at which a specifically Russian accommodation, and perhaps Soviet accommodation, between individuality and community, between originality and tradition, between innovation and preservation, was worked out. Perhaps out of his historical exigency following Peter the Great's turn toward the West, Russians relied on translation to learn about Western ways. But also perhaps because of their views on individual autonomy, Russians were generally less scandalized by translation, to use Venuti's expression, than were their Western counterparts. One way to understand this uh, is uh, in reference to what the Slavist Harriet Moroff has described as a text-centered model of literary production, in which texts are not vehicles of author authorial or national expression, and originality and authenticity are less relevant. In such, this contrasts to author-centered models, in which author and author's intentions are all important, and originality is the guarantor of subjectivity. If we see these models as endpoints on a climb, then the cultures of the developed West can be described certainly as more author-centered than Russia in general, and Soviet Russia in particular. For what Foucault refers to as the author function, which is the foundation of the author-centered model, was a product of European romanticism on the one hand, which transformed the artist from a craftsman into a genius, and of Western property law on the other, which protected that original genius through increasingly stringent co copyright laws. And while Western postmodern thinkers like Bart Derrida Bourdieu dream of a text-centered world of literary production, announcing the death of the author and the triumph of iterativity and the simulacrum, they were themselves the product of such a model and became authors with a capital A. They were academic celebrities. And while Russia has produced, of course, many authors, it is nonetheless true that Russian writers have expressed a deep ambivalence regarding the author function as it was constructed in the West. We see this ambivalence in the enormous sense of social responsibilities that was heaped onto Russia, uh, Russians, Russia's authors. It is no coincidence that Lev Tolstoy rejected the role of author altogether when he stopped writing novels at the very peak of his literary fame, turning instead to didactic prose and Bible translation. Nor is it a coincidence that copyright laws in Russia came much later than in the West and were never as stringently enforced. In fact, the Soviet government didn't sign on to the international copyright agreement until 1973. There is, I am arguing, a text-centered logic at work in Russian translation discourse that was intensified in the Soviet period, where original authors were treated with great suspicion and translations were heavily supported by the regime. The traditional, Rus the traditional Russian suspicion of authors was encouraged by Marxist theories of literature that downgraded the role of individual writers, relegating them to the economic superstructure and constructing them as inevitable and replaceable products of their historical moment. The semiotician Yuri Lotman, for example, was fond of telling the story of Nikolai Piksanov, a Marxist literary scholar who undertook to write a monumental history of wor world literature without naming a single author. And Soviet censors often dealt with troublesome authors and translators by publishing their works without attribution. <laughs>
In historicizing the author, Roland Barthes provides a good description of what I am calling text-centered cultures in his now famous essay, The Death of the Author. Bart writes, in ethnographic societies, the responsibility for a narrative is never assumed by a person, but by a mediator, shaman, or relator, I would add translator to this list, whose performance, the mastery of the narrative code, may possibly be admired, but never his genius. The author is a modern figure, a product of our society, insofar as emerging from the Middle Ages with English imperial, empiricism, French rationalism, and the pers personal faith of the Ref Reformation, it discovered the prestige of the individual, etc., uh, etc. Et Students, uh, Susan Susan Stewart makes a similar point in her wonderful book, Crimes of Representation, where she writes, before the development of concepts of original genius and intellectual property, all thoughts were potentially held in common. All thoughts were appropriable by readers, and it was those who disseminated ideas who reaped any rewards or punishment by such ideas. The concept of les belles infidèles, one could argue, marks a transitional moment in that evolution from a more text-centered medieval Renaissance culture to a more author-centered modern model of literary production, insofar as it both celebrates the violation of the author's original uh, while it uh, describes that violation as disloyal. While insightful, both Bart and Stewart's remarks betray an obvious Eurocentrism in placing tech-centered societies in the past as ethnographic, pre-modern, before, invoking an imaginative geography that divides the world into developed, into developed and underdeveloped cultures and economies. Remember the critique of Russia's Peter the Great leveled by Europe's great original Jean-Jacques Rousseau. According to Rousseau, Peter never possessed le génie de, or possessed only le génie de l'imitation and so was unable to create something out of nothing like true geniuses. From the time that imaginative geography was first traced by Western Enlightenment thinkers, Russia found itself on the wrong side of the developmental curve, marginalized as a culture of imitation. Scholars dealing with translation and cultures outside the West, however, have long recognized the methodological danger of, to quote Harish Trivedi, subscribing implicitly and unquestionably to the assumption that the Western concepts of the original and, tra and the translation are universal. In many non-Western cultures and in minor cultures, both inside and outside the West, a markedly different variation, valuation of translation, and of the more general concept of imitation persist. As my colleague Judy Wakabayashi notes, Western capitalist notions of ownership of the text and copyright, deriving partly from the fixedness and authoritativeness imparted by printing, unlike, for example, the impermanence of the palm leaf manuscripts long used in India and Southeast Asia, are linked to reverence for the written word and a highly developed sense that language expresses the thoughts of individuals. This differs from traditional notions in Southeast South and Southeast Asia, where public-private boundaries have been less sharply delineated, multiple retellings have made authorship often anonymous of little interest, and there was creative disrespect for the original. Although imported Western genres introduced the concept of originality, authorship, and the translator's subservience to the author, along with closer adherence to the original, traditional attitudes continue to influence contemporary thinking. These notions of authorship are clearly linked to broader notions of personal identity and subjectivity. As Ava Richter and Belan Song note, the very Western concept of personal identity rests on the foundation of the self, uh, of the idea of a person as distinct from the generic man. Its related construct is the self, a conscious, thinking, reflective, and autonomous entity, right? The individual. This, Richter and Song go on to argue, complicates the translation of Western notions of identity and subjectivity into Chinese, where self has different connotations and where individualism is frequently seen as negative, as in Russia. And so perhaps the first step in investigating the Euro Eurocentrism of translation studies is to historicize the author-centeredness that is often assumed in many of our explanatory models. Turi's polysystem theory, for example, assumes the existence of an author-centered universe in which translation exists as the defining other of original writing, thus situating translated literature at the margins of the literary polysystem, except in discrete moments, all right, when a culture is young or there is a perceived vacuum. But these conditions are temporary, and the assumption is that translated texts will inevitably wind up once again in their rightful spot on the margins. 
Therefore, the writing of alternative histories of translation through a text-centered lens is no idle academic enterprise. First, it may help us to reevaluate imitation in more positive terms as an aesthetic and uh, ethical practice. In pre-modern and early modern England, for example, a different conception of selfhood and individual identity was reflected in that culture's high regard for imitation. What Thomas, uh, Thomas Green, in fact, describes European Renaissance culture as an era of imitation. This was reflected not only in the widespread practice of translation among the educated classes, but also in the practice of the copybook, an aspect of English Renaissance culture that has been largely overshadowed by Stephen Greenblatt's more modern notion of self-fashioning. The practicing of copying, however, was in fact central to humanist education and reflected a concept of subjectivity that is strikingly different from a romantic subjectivity based on original genius. And so while in an author-centered world, translation may appear in Nabokov's phrase as the servile path, uh, in more text-centered cultures, it can appear, as in the Soviet gulag, as a most heroic uh, sacrifice. Let me uh, conclude by saying that uh, writing the history of translation through a text-centered lens may also help us to liberate literary studies what, from what has been called la tyrannie du national, for the romantic uh, author-centered model based on original genius is, of course, the same romantic model used to justify the existence of nations in romantic thought, making authors into the privileged reflection of the genius of a people. Studying literature within the limitations of romantic nationalist ideology has long unjustly delegated translators to the margins of literary history. You will not find in courses on Russian literature at most Western universities figures like Mikhail Mikhailov, the Russian publisher and translators whose translations of Heinrich Heine inspired generations of Russian progressive writers and thinkers. To write the history of literature through a text-centered lens would necessarily highlight the imagined nature of the national community and would resurrect the many cultural workers, Barts, mediators, shamans, and relators who have played such a central role in the preservation and circulation of culture. Russia's gulag translators, then, should remind us that translators are not second-rate or would-be authors. We are something different. We are imitators in the best sense of the word, dedicating to the preservation and circulation of texts. To quote the great Russian translator Gennady Shmakov in his translation of a poem by Cocteau, we are chranitili drugova nasledstva, custodians of a foreign, foreign inheritance. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for comments and questions, so the floor is open to you. after the cultural turn in the West, the original in Russian translation, literary translation, is still the sacred original, and the author is still something like a hypothesis. I mean, the, the author, the biography, is a model, almost something sacred. How do you explain this? And within your framework, you know, you want to resurrect all the chains of workings, but and the, the romantic paradigm of the genius, doesn't it survive more in Russia than anywhere else? <laughs> Yes, but I, I think the translator was a model that exists side by side with that in a way that it didn't, it hasn't existed in the West because it was, uh, translation and translators were a way for Russians to express their ambivalence about individualism and originality at the same time that, yes, they had cults of, cults of authors, 
uh, at the same time. So it's actually, I, I want to, I should say, a complex uh, literary landscape, but that these gulag, conditions of the gulag, maybe highlight some things that, about the culture that we wouldn't have seen uh, otherwise. And especially this ambivalence about uh, putting yourself forward. It was a, a place, translation and translation discourse was a place for Russians to suggest or work out a different accommodation between this originality and individualism. Uh, but again, it's a very com uh, contested, all of these things were very contested. Yeah. Please use the microphone. There's a microphone. No, no, I, I think that I'm able to project my voice. Okay, as you like. <laughs> I'm delighted. As a Russian person, I'm delighted to attend this presentation because it makes justice to Russian culture. Yes, I'm able to understand that probably for the sake of the presentation, you put extra emphasis you know, to some points. But what I would like to add that obviously uh, I was born after Stalin died. But I had the privilege to work in the biggest publishing house, Progress Publishers. We published books in more than 100 languages. And the publishing house was started in 1929. So it was initiated by maybe the Minister of Culture at that time, I don't know, as something to give job places for people who came to Russia foreigners, members of the third uh, international or communist organization. So whenever I say about my education, it's not about me, it's about the system. Whenever they ask where I was educated, in addition to academic institutions, I've always named progress publishers because to me it was number one institution in my uh, spiritual development. Living in the Soviet Union, I had access to foreign cultures be be because I was working there. And again, translation under the Soviet regime and for Russian minds, it is always an opportunity to say something about the regime as well. So it's a secret code for us. And answering um, the question about why still in Russia we have uh, uh, such an admiration for authors, even in translation, because to a Russian person, Pisatin is and Pisatin is born. We have the cult of authors. Luckily, we do not have a cult of football players. <laughs> and I'm very proud to say, and I'm absolutely sure that never. Never in my life we will have a president who is a who is an actor. <laughs> I would also say that the Gulag, in the Gulag translations, those translators were translating texts. They weren't translating the oeuvre of Byron, right? She was translating Don Juan, they were translating these specific poems. I mean, Svetayeva translated Le Voyage by Baudelaire, not all of Baudelaire. So in that context, too, they were very text-focused, and it was about preserving these texts for, and speaking through them. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Brian, again. We now have a five minutes break, five minutes only, and then the EST meeting starts here. Okay, five minutes break, then it goes on. Sorry, I was calling you up from the other side. Science problem. Anthony Grimm, tell me to stop. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. <laughs>
just like that you mentioned the Squeenix, because I, I worked in Latvia for two years, and I, and I met him several times, and, and he told me, you know, you, you learned Russian in, in, in the Gulag. What in the Gulag, right? Yeah, yeah, and he, and he says from many, very many languages. Oh. For instance, from Sweden, which he did, I, did, I mean, he used several other yeah. translations, and you know, dictionaries. Yeah, yeah. But he also translated um, his famous Swedish poet from the 18th century, Belmar. That's why I came to know so, yeah. and I went there, yeah, but he, which was the Russian translator of translation? Daniel. 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 He was mostly an author, but he did translation work, and then when he was in prison. But he didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, I think he might have 